one of the things I, I felt strongly when I first came to TCTND is that we're not reporting on a single study. We're reporting on what it adds. You're listening to Parallax from Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. Here is your host, Ankur Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Parallax. Um, this is um, a, a unique episode for so many reasons. Um, you know, uh, first off, my guest on today's show is, uh, you know, by no means a stranger to, um, you know, all of us or many of us within the cardiovascular disease or cardiology community. Um, she has um, done seminal work um, as editor and journalist for TCTMD. Um, she actually is a, a recent recipient of, of a prestigious award, the Wenger Award, and we're going to talk about it uh, on today's show. And, um, you know, Shelley Wood uh, has, the, the name resonates with so many of us and so many of us have followed her work uh, and, you know, her journalism has helped break stories for not only many leading randomized clinical trials and and other you know seminal research works that are published in cardiovascular medicine but also tackling important topics which are you know relevant at work you know whether it comes to women in cardiology or women in medicine and also you know taking decisions on featuring you know articles on the on the me too movement in medicine um is so um, you know, she obviously has has led the frontier. Um, you know, even within the social aspects of of our our work life and, and our professions. Um, so, with that introduction, uh, Michelle, welcome to Parallax. Welcome on the show. I'm I'm so grateful that you're doing this. I'm honored to have you as a guest on my show. And you know, thanks again for doing this for us. Oh, I'm I'm very flattered to be asked. I always say this when people want to speak with me and this kind of it doesn't happen very often, but to be interviewed like this is really having the tables turned. So I'm slightly nervous, must admit. <laughs> oh yeah, you don't have to be you don't have to be nervous. I I mean, you host a very successful podcast yourself and you know, this is very familiar territory for you. I mean, you you are a journalist um par excellence and extraordinary yourself. So c- congratulations for all the work that you do and and for the Wenger Award. Um, but before we get there, and, and I'm sure we will, I want to ask you um, a little bit about your journey to TCTMD, you know, a little bit about what were your your occupations in the past before you decided to, you know, become the managing editor or the editor for TCTMD and, you know, and, you know, basically put medical journalism as a, as a center focus because I also know you're a published author. So I, I want to delve into your your journey to TCTMD. Sure. Well, hopefully some of your listeners will remember <laughs> some of where I began because um, I studied journalism. It's more than 20 years ago. And the graduate program I did at the University of British Columbia required you to specialize. So I specialized in in health and medical journalism. And I honestly thought I'd end up at a a newspaper or a magazine. Um, But it was uh, coincided with the launch of a website I hope people remember, which was theheart.org. And I joined it actually in 1999, writing about echocardiography, I think was what I was doing. Um, And that was my first job at a journalism school. And and I was with theheart.org for 12 years. Um, I became editor in 2008 and, um, and did that until 2009, maybe. And um, yeah, and then of course, it transitioned to be Medscape and Medscape cardiology. And, um, and yeah, that transition wasn't so easy for some of us that had been involved in the heart.org originally, but, you know, it's gone on to great strengths and things like that. But that's really where I got my start not only just health journalism and not just medical journalism, but something much more specific, which was cardiology journalism. Yeah, no, excellent. So um, cardiology journalism um, is, is obviously very important. You know, I mean, I think a lot of us, including myself actually, um, you know, get introduced to studies, which we wouldn't have otherwise read or have come across, you know, through TCTMD and, I think the heart.org or Medscape cardiology sort of does, um, you know, fill in a, a similar space, but 
Um, and I think I, I sort of read this um, or maybe um, either, either read this at TCTMD or, or I, I thought I, I heard you speak at, at, at some other event that, or maybe, you know, you were being quoted that TCTMD is actually the only, only um, website or the only publication, which is, which, which focuses on cardiology journalism because, you know, Medscape or WebMD, you know, you know, these are sites which have a much broader reach um, and sort of TCTMD has grown uh, over the past, you know, several years. I, and, you know, maybe you can, uh, actually, it would be great if you can sort of tell us the TCTMD story through your lens. Uh, but do you think that TCTMD in that aspect is very unique um, in that it, it specifically focuses on cardiology journalism and, and still is a very popular, you know, news slash media outlet? Yeah, I mean, I certainly would hope so. Um, I do have to give credit. I think originally the heart.org really was the first ones that were really just focusing in on heart disease news and they were doing it for people who were experts in that field. And I think that, that I think what I had trouble with, um, with Medscape is because as you say, it was more of a broader audience. So I think it was bringing more of a general medical audience to heart disease news and it became a bit more diluted in terms of you know, at one point, I think there were seven journalists working on it full time, and then they sort of got distributed in different ways across Medscape. And I can't malign them because some of them are, I consider, friends and were great colleagues and mentors to me. So um, they're still doing great work. But for me, I left Medscape when I did in part because it didn't have the depth anymore, um, specifically to cardiology news. Um, and to be honest, I also quit. I'd been doing it for 14 years, and I my reason for quitting was because I wanted to try some other writing completely. As you alluded to earlier, I, I wanted to try writing fiction. Um, and then the opportunity to work again at a website that was going to be focused exclusively on cardiology, which is the offer I got from TCTMD. Uh, you know, it was too good to pass up. It, it was a chance to work again with a team of journalists and doing um, in-depth coverage of cardiovascular disease topics. Uh, and so I, I jumped back in after taking a year sort of out to do other types of things. Um, and yeah, since joining TCTMD, which, as you mentioned, was very much focused on interventional cardiology exclusively, but it had it had five full time journalists working on interventional cardiology. And and in my mind, it, it, it was doing you know, great stuff, but I wanted to broaden it. So starting six years ago, when I first joined, I I really did try to broaden that footprint to encompass all of the topics I'd loved talk, uh, covering in the past. So heart failure, heart rhythm, prevention, um, so many other aspects of cardiology that I think, whether it was an interventional cardiologist reader or a different um, subspecialist, that, that they would want those topics um, to be covered in depth as well. So um, I hope it now comes across to people, not just as an interventional cardiology website, but as a website that's covering all the important topics that we're not doing it just as, as a print um, medium, but also through podcasts, through through video, through other um, ways of, of learning and gathering information. Um, but also that for interventional cardiologists, they still feel that they're being served by the website that was kind of their clubhouse for many, many years before I joined. Um, so that's a bit of a bigger vision and a broader vision, but I, I think it's working. I think the name is confusing to people sometimes because it's associated still with the TCT meeting, but it's become a brand unto itself. So um, I can't complain. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I second what you just said, the the latter part of your of our conversation that it has become a brand unto itself. And, you know, congratulations to you for, you know, making that vision a reality for not only, you know, I mean, it, it was sort of the go to place for content and you know, I still go there for slides and and, and talks, and I I, I listen uh, and I, I always learn. But I, I think more so, you know, now that you know it's it's become it's catering to a much broader audience within the within the subspecialty. You know, one of the medicine subspecialties of cardiovascular medicine. Um, so th- here's a question for you, and I think this you you're at you're at a perfect position to answer this because you worked. Um, you know, you, from the genesis of the heart.org, the, this idea of, you know, having a cardiovascular medicine specific focus media outlet slash website, 
who who came up with this idea and you know was there was there skepticism when this was brought up early on um and you know what did the believers say or or think and what did the naysayers you know say or think yeah the history the backstory i don't know that i'm in the best position to answer all of it um the the idea for the website to the best of my knowledge was um an idea born out by a, a man named roger samard who was a, a quebecois um a, ph- a pharmacist by training but i believe he was the one that got it started with two partners eric baudouin and greg um Ogrodnik, who went on to work for a, an organization that I understand has just been very successful on the public market. But apart from that, it was also Eric Topol. He was a huge part of getting the heart.org off the ground, as was Larry Houston, who went on to do Cardio Brief and was my first editor. So I want to put those names of those five men at the helm of the idea. Um, early journalists like Susan Jeffrey and, and Susan Hughes were also some of the first hired, I believe, um, and so definitely had a role in shaping it. But I think at the time, you know, the Internet was so new. I don't think there were naysayers. I think they were people excited to know that a group of people were devoting their energies to putting cardiovascular news and, and education online. It, it, it then, you know, I think it's evolved so much with time. People are spoiled for choice when it comes to websites they can go to to find information and and forget about websites. You know, they can go to this podcast, they can go to apps, they can go to live meeting streaming. But at least in the very beginning, websites devoted to cardiovascular news and education, they allowed people to sit at home and not travel to the ESC meeting or the ACC meeting you could tune into the website and get these essentially synopses in the form of news stories um, or slideshows and things like that. And I think it was just a way for people to access information that they couldn't physically get to. And that is what has really changed over the past 20 years is um, so many meetings themselves are streaming content in different ways, or they have their own, you know, companion websites. And then the pandemic, of course, added a whole other layer of what does a meeting look like when you're in lockdown and you're staying at home? So it's changed so much over the past two decades. I, I can't even summarize it except to say that it was very exciting to be in at, at the ground level when it was providing that type of content to people on their computer screens. It was you know, very novel back then. Um, and then, of course, it's been fascinating to watch it evolve and see people's the way people consume information has just changed you know, every year, you, you can't keep doing what we were doing 15 years ago. You have to stay ahead of it. And and podcasts like yours is one of those, frankly. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's, it's always fascinating for me to learn the, the genesis and the history because it, it, you know, for someone, you know, like myself and others included, um, who, you know, for example, wanted to start a podcast like Parallax and talk about, you know, seminal issues and topics, which, you know, affect us. I, I, I I would, I, I didn't, I, I specifically didn't want to use the word plague us. You know, they affect us when we hear about, you know, Me Too in medicine and when, when we hear about challenges women colleagues face in interventional cardiology or cardiovascular medicine and, you know, other challenges which are very front and center in our professional lives. But, you know, there isn't a forum to talk about these, or at least I felt at the time when I, when I came up with Parallax and, and pitched it to Ratliff, I, I, I thought that there wasn't a platform to talk about these issues. And, you know, maybe Parallax could be a platform where, you know, I could get, I could get cardiologists and guests who are comfortable and enough and also vulnerable enough to share their personal stories and, and talk about these topics. So, you know, I think for someone uh, who is trying to trying something new, I think it, it, for me uh, in, in, and and others, I think it's always great to talk to people like yourself who were at front and center of innovations like the heart.org, you know, two decades ago. So, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. No problem. I mean, in some ways, I say we're spoiled for choice, but we're also threatened by it because there are there are too many options, not just in, in cardiovascular news and information, but in all of the media we consume. And I I think what your podcast does and what I hope I've succeeded in with TCTMD is putting a a familiar name and face to the content because 
there's too much anonymous um, content. There's too much generated content. I even hate the word content to some extent, because I think it's really important given how many options people have for finding information that they can find a relatable voice or they can find a familiar voice or a trusted voice. Um, and that is the only thing that can really differentiate all the different forms of online information that people have access to. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I think when you, when you put a face and a familiar, familiarity to the, the content that you're publishing um, online um, and you sort of develop that trust relationship with the, with the reader, um, or, you know, in, in, in the case of podcasts with the listenership. And then, you know, the, there's that, that irrevocable bond, right? Which, which you create. And I think it's, and then you develop loyalty points and, you know, that's how platforms grow and that's how TCTMD grew and will continue to grow, uh, which, which I think is, is a great segue for me to uh, bring up TCTMD, um, you know, as, as the focal point of our discussion now. And that is, you know, when you are, I mean, a tremendous amount of research gets published on a daily basis in cardiovascular medicine. And, you know, there are people like me who will actively reach out to you with, with page proofs and, and, you know, giving a heads up of, you know, hey, Shelly, this is coming out. What do you think? And you've been gracious enough to respond, um, you know, to, to basically tell me if, if this is, you know, worth your, attention or not, or, or if there are other competing, you know, trials or studies that are coming out. And, you know, I've been, uh, you know, always very grateful for your responses. Uh, but then, you know, how, I mean, trials and, and I get it, late breakers are maybe sort of the easy fix, but, you know, not, not every study, which is an important study or which may be a gem actually gets presented in a late breaking format or, or, or a form like that. How do you pick, how do you select those, those studies? Well, uh, and I'm, I know journals do their, um, you know, they, they sort of send the embargoed PDFs to media houses. Um, you know, this has been my own experience working through some of the, uh, some of the top line journals within cardiovascular medicine, but I wanted to sort of get the backstage from you as to how you filter in all, all the research that's coming out on a daily basis. Yeah. It's such a imperfect science. And I, I have been asked this question a lot and honestly, on uh, any given day, I might answer it differently. Certainly I am bombarded with um, the sort of, TOCs and embargoed mailers that come out from the major journals that I subscribe to, um, the cardiology journals, as well as some of the general medicine journals. So that's a, a major source. Um, in that instance, though, of course, you're going to be covering the same thing that most of your competitors do, because we're all getting spooned the same information. Um, I do rely, and I'll plug it right now, but I do encourage anybody who thinks they're working on something interesting to reach out um, but as I say, on, on, on a certain day, um, I might have only two journalists working that day. The others are on holiday or the whole team might be focused on a, a feature project that's taking all of their time. So I, I often have people say to me, well, why did you cover that? That's such a small study. And the answer is often, well, I couldn't find anything else that was interesting. And I personally thought that would be cool. Um, but other times it is a, a question of not having enough time and not being able to stretch to it all. And it's really important to me that we do things in the right amount of depth. Um, we do produce a lot of content on TCTMD, but the hope is that we do add some uh, layers of context and interview and um, history. I think, you know, one of the things I, I felt strongly when I first came to TCTMD is that we're not reporting on a single study. We're reporting on what it adds to the body of work that's come before. Um, but to answer your question, how to select what we cover, I do feel like I, I, I select a lot of what I find interesting to me. And sometimes that's because it's something I myself have been covering for years and years, or it's something I've never seen before. And I think that's surprising because I feel like I've seen a lot at this point. Um, but it, it is imperfect and um, it's a shifting um, sort of state of events. Um, and I, it even happens that I will go down the path of starting to work on a story personally, or I will assign it to someone on the team to cover. 
and then they just can't get to it, or we don't get the callbacks that are required to make the story live. Um, and it might get canceled. And I, it doesn't happen very often. I usually say if we've interviewed someone, we need to find a way to cover the paper or the topic in some way, just because people have given us their time. But I will kill a story if it doesn't seem um, that, that we've, we've done justice to it or that the work itself, once we've dug into it, doesn't warrant us paying that much attention to it. Um, but yeah, to, to make, to reiterate the point, I love it when people reach out with stuff and not just a study that they themselves have co-authored or a study that they think is interesting, but issues. It's, it's so some of our best stories, of course, will come from a topic that's really bugging someone and they're not seeing it get the recognition it deserves. And they send me an email and say, are you aware that X, um, happened at Y and can we look into it? Um, those are the best stories. They always are. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great to learn. And, you know, thank you for sharing, you know, how you pick, uh, you know, um, studies or, or content that you think is, uh, deserves, uh, you know, a place on, on TCTMD, which, um, then, um, you know, brings me to my next question. And that is the veracity of the content. And I, I know you, you alluded to it when you were answering the question that I, I just asked. And, um, what, what has impressed me is, is the veracity of, of the content that is published on TCTMD and how serious, you know, you are in getting it right, uh, you know, factually, scientifically, um, and also, you know, making sure that you are getting a balanced point of view. So, you know, you'll have quotes from, um, you know, different cardiologists who, who may be opinionated, uh, um, you know, or, you know, have, have differing opinions, uh, which, which I think is, is always important when you're covering a controversial topic um, when it comes to evidence uh, within cardiovascular medicine. Um, how, how do you, uh, I mean, to the point that, you know, I'm like, I, I, this is me personally, right. But I, I don't, I, I will be confident in not checking the source if I know that I'm reading it at TCTMD. So I think that that's a compliment to you and your team. Uh, you know, for getting it right. And, you know, I've, I've been, I've been the recipient of this, um, uh, of, of this phenomenon, you know, for lack of a better word, it, you know, is when last year, when uh, your team covered um, uh, one of, one of the studies that I presented at DCT. Um, and th th it was a question on how the data were analyzed. And, you know, we were back and forth on emails with, with Dr. Mamas Mamas, who's, who's terrific, by the way. And, you know, congratulations for recruiting him to your team. Um, how, 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 how do you, how do you develop that culture amongst journalists and, and colleagues? And what, what is the dialogue that you're having with yourself and with, with them? Um, maybe on a continual basis so that you get the story right and perfect each time. How do you do that? I think at some level that's journalism 101. And, um, you know, we sometimes we have a, a fellowship program, for example, where we take journalists that are doing graduate degrees in, in um, health journalism for the most part. And they have some trepidation about working for a site that's so quote unquote scientific. The audience is physicians, but that the principles of journalism are the same. You need to check your facts. You need to, you have to rely on the source material, but if something smells off, then you need to dig deeper into it. So I think you could be a journalist in any field and come to this one and, and the instincts to, to check and to verify should be drummed into you if you, if you're, you know, worth your salt. Um, and then I think as, as an editor, I feel like I can tell when a journalist is writing about a topic that he or she doesn't fully understand. You, you can see it in the writing and you can see it in, in the tone, or you can see it in the overuse of a quote rather than explaining um, the point in some way. So I, I feel like that's one thing I've learned over 20 years is how to kind of sniff out um, something in a story where it, it's not clear that the writer fully understands the subject matter. Uh, but what I've learned, you know, more, almost more important than getting it right as often as you possibly can is also having the humility to, to, to notice when you've done it wrong and you've got it wrong. And I used to, I think when I was younger and less experienced, be so upset, especially when I first became an editor, 
when we got something wrong or our headline didn't cut it. Um, and instead, over the years, I've realized that each time we make a mistake and have the chance to correct it and, and own that correction, it is a learning moment. And it must happen in, in the medical press as well, like, by which I mean the journals. Um, you know, there's facts and uh, fact checking and, and corrections that are issued all the time. But um, for me, every time I realize I think I or I'm acting like I understand a topic inside out, that for me is always the red flag that actually I am probably missing the obvious. I need to step back and I look, need to look at it a different way. And I might have all the facts correct, but I might not be fully immersed in the content or the reason that it was, you know, a study was done or an endpoint was chosen. Um, and I love that feeling of, of thinking, okay, I don't know everything. What is the thing that I don't know? And that I think is when you get to the level of, of news that has the, the right amount of detail and the right amount of context. And that that's, it goes beyond medicine. That goes for any great journalism. We'll, we'll have that questing sense of what is the thing that's not being asked. Um, I love that feeling. Yeah. So which, which actually brings me to my next question. And that is, um, I mean, and you know, this is my ignorance. So, you know, you, you can just, you can just stop me right away or just correct me if I'm, if I'm totally wrong and that's fine. But when you, when you're studying journalism and then you pick, um, you know, a stream, for example, you know, medical journalism or, or you fall into it by accident, but yes, exactly. Yeah. And so like, do you, when, do you study, like, for example, do you like get into the specifics of cardiovascular disease? Like, do you study that as a topic? Where do you pick? Or is it just that you, this is something that you, you know, learn on the fly. And as you start covering more and more studies, you sort of start getting a sense of where the field has been and where the field is moving. Because, and this is from someone who's never taken any other profession in his life. You know, I've just been from high school to medicine and medicine it has been for all these years. So I don't know how people from other backgrounds and professions interact with, with medical literature. Yeah. Well, I've probably lost, I've lost the sense of that as well, but I think there's a million ways to get to this point. Um, and certainly the five journalists in my team, they've come from so many different backgrounds. Some have science backgrounds or, uh, sort of biomedical backgrounds. None of us are physicians. None of us have any training in that. That was part of the reason of wanting to bring Mamas on board or, uh, you know, we wanted somebody who had clinical knowledge because none of us are, are practicing physicians and we have this knowledge built up from talking to doctors over the years, but we don't actually have the hands-on understanding of why something's important. Um, but I think the people that work in this very specialized area of, of journalism dealing with medical topics um, they come to it from different paths and they really learn it along the way. Uh, and I'm always amazed by how much I miss if I, uh, I think of the year that I took out, um, that the year that I took off writing about cardiology disease was the year that Arnie's came out. And I have this, uh, I always have this thing in my head that I don't really understand Secubitril Valsartan quite as well as I should, because all of that happened in the year that in my mind, I had retired from cardiology journalism and wasn't sure I'd go back. Um, but that's just an example of, of the fact that you, you learn it while you're doing it and by talking to people who have the patience to explain things to you. And um, there's no, no one has any specialized training in cardiology. They've just learned it as they've gone along. Yeah, no, the, the, that's, that was excellent, you know, insightful. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. So the one thing which I, I think TCT MD has is unique in terms of, and, and I'm talking content, and I think has uniquely done well over the years, and I think has continued to build on what they've done, you know, sort of the foundation is, um, also thinking and thinking a lot about training and fellows and covering about fellows. I mean, I was, I, I, I was a blogger, uh, when I was a fellow, uh, for TCTMD and I, I still, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's kind of the, the writing, which is, which is unique, um, is, and I still have it on my CV and I, I, I have it proudly displayed on my CV. Um, but, uh, you know, just to getting back to the point of like focusing on, on fellows and fellowship education and training and, and getting fellows to be bloggers. 
um, why is um, why is that? And, and I'm sure you know. I mean, f- whether it's med students, residents, or fellows, they're obviously consumers of of content at TCTMD. So I, I know that they're an important component of your readership. But as someone, like as as a section within cardiovascular medicine, why is you know fellowship or fe- why are fellows important to TCTMD? Because I, I, that's yeah. that's I think that's uh, the fact that they are is great. Uh, you know, congratulations, but I, I want to get to the why. Yeah, I cannot take any credit and, and you'll have to have Yael Maxwell back on your, your podcast because this is before my time at TCTMD. But as far as I know, it was her idea to launch the Fellows Forum as a subsection of TCTMD.com. And the thinking there, of course, is, you know, let's let's get them early. Let's get them hooked on what we're doing um, when they're doing their training. I'm sure that was part of the, the thinking. But the other thing is that they, they're, they're a voice that we don't tend to hear quite as often. Um, if I have a journalist working on a story, they're not going to reach out to someone super junior to ask for his or her opinion um, uh, on a clinical trial of a drug or a device. They, they would, of course, reach out if it was something related to training or, or being more junior in your career and all the things that go into that, of course, then that's somebody that you'd want to speak with. But um, for the, the topics we cover, to have credibility, you need to interview people who have some cachet in the field. And of course, for a fellow, that takes some time to build up. Um, but I will give Yael credit. She, she um, made the case that this is a group of people whose voices aren't necessarily being heard, but they do have interesting things to say. And what they say will be of interest to their peers. And their peers are not being served necessarily by some of the other work that we're doing um, so yeah, Elle fully has developed that section in terms of having bloggers, in terms of profiling fellows at different stages of their careers and of having uh, them on camera where she has, even through the pandemic, um, done videos with people on different topics. And I actually think, and it took me this year to really think this through is that while the, the content on the fellows forum is really relevant to fellows in training, man, if, if more senior physicians had time to go back and look at some of that, I think it would help maybe connect them to that early stage of their own careers and remind them of, of the special challenges that are involved in that. Uh, Yael did a video on what it was like to juggle a fellowship with um, maternity leave or with having a young child at home. And I couldn't help but think, you know, if some of the cardiologists that I know in their 50s and 60s who might have forgotten what it was like to take on new information at the same time you were trying to learn how to be a mom or a dad. Um, that that would be a good little refresher perhaps for them to watch and hopefully some of them did. Yeah, no, you know, congratulations again to Yale and, and to you. Uh, I mean, it's it, it still remains um, a very special time in my life. I remember those years vividly and I remember those, those blogs that I wrote uh, when I wrote them. Um, and, you know, I, every now and then go back, you know, to read my own blogs that I wrote, uh, you know, just to sort of like, you know, t- to the point that you said that. You to know, time just- travel a little bit. Yeah. But you know what? You are a rare breed because, and I often say this, is that I'm really glad that there's not that many physicians that enjoy writing because if they did, I would never have had the career that I had because I wouldn't be needed in some ways. But but you, because you yourself write and uh, you, you have a great voice as a blogger, um, it's at this point now where I actually would like there to be a few more people like you because we have several blogs on TCTMD. We have off script, which is uh, usually physicians that author these first person blogs for us. You've done one of those for me as well. Um, but then, yeah, the, the fellows forum blog, uh, you know, just to have um, physicians who with everything else they have going on, enjoy putting words on the page and have a, a bone to pick um, or, you know, a bee in their bonnet about a topic that they want to tell us about in the first person I, I, it is a slightly different voice than you would use for an editorial. It's a little bit more personal and it's a little bit more colloquial maybe. Um, so yeah, let's plug that as well. If there's people listening to this podcast that, that have something they feel like saying in the first person on one of TCTMD's blog, they should reach out to me. Yeah, no, awesome. And, you know, I, again, I mean, the, the, the one that I wrote, uh, the off script is actually very, very special to me, uh, you know, personally and, um, 
I've, I haven't done yet, but I've actually thought of getting it printed and framing it because it's, uh, again, uh, you know, something that I, I went through and that's, I mean, I'm sure my wife did too. I mean, she's a mother and, but more, I think more, more than this is my perception, obviously is like, I went through it a lot more than she did. And, and that's something that I also wrote in, in the blog because I was just in the field and I just knew too much. Um, to sort of ask all the questions and anticipate all the problems. And I think um, between the two of us, you know, she was that, she was that parent patient who, who was, who, who had the, you know, the bliss of ignorance and, and was just waiting in anticipation of a successful surgery. Whereas, where I, whereas, you know, me, I, I was like anticipating every, every single step in the operating room. So no, thank you for the opportunity for me to, to pen that and, uh, you know, I after it was published on TCTMD last year, I got a lot of emails and notes and, you know, even on Twitter, people reaching out. I think it resonates with people. Either they've been in a situation that they can imagine as similar or they, you know, would find it hard to imagine that situation and have the empathy to, that would prompt them to reach out. So that's the whole point, I think, of a, a blog and in a way is that it it is trying to find that point of connection with readers or viewers and um, then lead them to some sort of larger, larger thought on the broader topic. So, yeah, hopefully people will go and look for you. They just need to search your name on TCTND and it will come up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, um, Shelley, final few minutes uh, in the podcast. And I do want to, again, congratulate you on the Wenger Award. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? No, I'm hugely flattered. It's I even the fact that you reached out to invite me on the podcast, and I'm sure that was the trigger. But I have to say, I I had I this is going to sound terrible. This wasn't even on my radar as something that I would be eligible for or that I would be noticed for. Um, I have squandered countless dollars over the years um, submitting my work for different prizes and awards. Um, there's always a fee. That's why I say squandered, but. I have been fortunate enough uh, over my career to to pick up a couple journalism awards for different pieces or series and, and things like that. The podcast picked up a small thing at one point. Um, but those are things that I chose myself and I, I submitted my work and I kind of shoved it under people's noses and it, it was adjudicated. Um, the Wenger Award was an email that just came in my inbox telling me that I was being honored with, you know, in the media category. Um, by Women Heart, which is the organization that has the award named after uh, Nanette Cass Wenger herself. And I, I was just floored. Like I just had my, my strongest sentiment was someone's been noticing. Somebody has been reading my work, not just reading it, but noticing um, what I, I have been doing consciously and probably before that unconsciously, which, which has been trying to interview more female cardiologists and as a corollary the type of work that female cardiologists are often doing, um, not often, but more often than men, perhaps they are doing research that that is looking at some of the gaps in care um, that breaks down a, across gender lines. So for me, I was just completely taken aback by it. I, I, I don't know how competitive it is. Maybe they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. My husband's going to kill me for saying that because he says I'm downplaying it, but um I, I did go and look at some of the other people that have won these this award in this category before, um, and even just the the other women that were honored this year. And I I am just so honored to be among them. Um, I'm still kind of recovering from it, in a good way. Yeah, no, well, I mean, you know, it truly well deserved, and you know, I think it, it comes from a, a great place in in someone's heart who actually you know ha has been following your work and nominated you for the right reasons and. Well, I'm pretty sure it was Martha Gulati. I thought it was a, more than one person, but I think it was Martha Gulati who, who nominated me. So a million thank yous to her because I, I have known Dr. Gulati's work for many years. We've I've interviewed her multiple times, but it, you know, just the thought that she had put two and two together in terms of um, what it might mean to have to, to do the type of work that I do and, and how that would resonate for an organization committed to um, closing the gaps in terms of heart disease in women diagnostically and in care and prevention, all those things. I, I, I still am amazed and, and yeah, honored. There's no other word. Yeah, I know that again, you know, 
congratulations for all you do and congrats on the award well deserved no question and you know i was just i i was just happy for you i mean that was the reason i reached out to you in person on email because i've known you we've interacted on email and we've seen each other in conferences i thought it was just i, I was just happy and i thought i'll just uh, i needed to congratulate a colleague so that that was the that was the verve <laughs> Well, thank you. Just making the honor extend for a couple more weeks. The glow will continue. <laughs> Thanks to you. Yeah, no, no, th- that truly well deserved. So, we, and then you know, my my final question, I, I think, uh, is what do you what do you see? What, what is in your vision? What What are some of the the things that you think you wanted to accomplish and haven't accomplished yet for TCTMD or for you know journalism um, at large? Um, and then maybe if you want to talk to us a little bit about your fiction writing and where do you, where do you, you see that going in the future? So future for you as an author and future for TCTMD or cardiovascular disease journalism at large. <laughs> That's a big one. Okay. Well, let me take the first part of it in terms of what I want to do with my career. And, and, uh, I, I seriously am kind of gobsmack that I'm 20 years beyond 20 years into it at this point I still feel junior and and forget that I'm not Um, but what I've really taken so much pride in over the past couple years is really just watching the journalists and my team go from strength to strength Um, when I first joined with the exception of Michael Reardon who was with me at the the heart.org and and came over to TCTMD shortly after I I started here um, and the others also have worked in other places. Todd Neal was at MedPage Today before he came to TCTMD, and Laura McEwen worked for many years at WebMD, actually. Um, but anyhow, for all of them, I did feel that when I joined, they weren't given the space and the motivation or the whip cracking, maybe, to really explore topics in depth and to turn to features that had no connection to a journal article or a meeting presentation, but to really just take an idea and pull on the thread and talk to cool people and see where the story would lead. And as much as I love writing so much, I love having the time to really dig into a story myself. I don't have as much time for that now. And it has almost surprised me how much I've taken pleasure in watching others do it and then being able to work with the finished product to make sure that the story just really sings, that it really doesn't have holes, that it really is doing something that I would say is important Um, and there's always time constraints. So, you know, it could always be even better if we had more time, but you know, I think of us as a daily service, a a daily news service. So we do try to turn things around quickly. So in my career over however many years I I have ahead of me, I'm really looking forward to to mentoring other um, writers and editors and, and watching their work get better and better. Um, But I think there was a second part to that question Journalism, journalism more generally, I I couldn't tell you. I think that the format will change. I think the way that we digest it um, will change and the way it's produced will change. I think people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, which depresses me because I really like long form journalism, even if I myself am not making time to digest that as much as I would like to. Um, But yeah, I think we need to be creative in terms of how we're serving up information and um, opinion and and making that a clear distinction between the two. Um, and your third question was about my fiction writing, which I'm super flattered you asked about. And I know that you yourself are a poet. Um, but yeah, words really matter to me. I think I honestly fell into journalism because I loved writing. And I didn't think I could write fiction or poetry. I just didn't think I had the chops. So I fell into journalism and it has just been such a rewarding career. I think I've been able to flex my writing muscle um, for many years as a journalist in ways that I didn't think would make me um, fit as a writer, (laughs) but it has. Um, And yeah, then quite late in life, I think I was in my, probably in my late thirties or early forties, I thought, you know, if I don't try writing fiction, then I, I'll never will. Um, So while working full time, I was, tried to write short stories and had a couple of those published. And then as just to come full circle in our conversation, it was in 2014, I decided I needed to, to make a big change in my life. I, I wasn't enjoying some of the changes that were happening at the website where I was. And so decided to just cut the cord and, and try to write a novel. I gave myself a year to do it. I actually had a non-compete clause at WebMD, which afforded me the chance to not write about cardiology for a year. 
Um, and it worked out for me. I, I got a draft of my novel done. I accepted the job at TCTMD when the year was up and I've, I've enjoyed it so much. Um, and the novel was published um, in 2019 and became a bestseller in Canada, which was very exciting for me. Um, the problem now is that I'm enjoying my my day job too much to quit it to write my second novel. So I have been trying to and succeeding uh, working on my fiction in the very early hours of the morning um, before coming into work at, at 730, which I do because uh, I'm on the West Coast. So. One day, hopefully, people will see a second novel in print by me. But for now, they'll have to just read my tweets. <laughs> yeah, no, th thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, I, um, it, I, I get it that you have to devote a certain number of hours on a daily basis. I, I would, I, I second that. I, I, you know, it's, um, and again, you know, I think it, it comes naturally to those who, who like writing, you know, who love writing, um, but still, you know, if you have a day job and if you have a busy one and if you have other things, you know, which, you know, are, are earning the bread is, is how I say, then, you know, your your vocation or passion is is important. You know, I think it, it sort of lends lends you that purpose and and, you know, makes you want to do 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 good things. And I, I I'm I'm probably going to you know, offline, you know, send you an email and getting some more tips on how to write more effectively, you know, like write fiction more effectively as in, are you dedicating time each day or are you picking a day in a week to sort of plow through some of the writing or? Oh my gosh, there's so many different ways to do that. I, I, I personally find I need to work on it very steadily and I, I try to carve out time every day, but obviously some days don't, don't lend itself to that. But I think everyone finds a different way to build it in. Uh, and you know what I would say, because I, I did think, oh my gosh, I've had a best-selling novel. I should stop writing about cardiology. I should become a, a full-time fiction writer. Um, and what my big epiphany was, is that having a day job that I love, that I'm good at, that is challenging, that is rewarding. It was such a help because if you're toiling away in your pajamas at five in the morning trying to write fiction and it's not going well, it's really good to know that you have something good to fall back on um, that, as you say, we get a paycheck for um, because I think fiction writing, and I'm sure it's the same with poetry and any art form, it can be very lonely. Um, and in a way, it's nice to have this more social and rewarding day job because um, it gives you the energy to go back to the passion project afterwards. Yeah, I I completely second that. I, I couldn't agree more. And and I think it's um, you, you know I, I think it's I, I'm I'm just grateful that I, um, I I'm sure you are too. You know have have meaningful lives in in doing what we do and still have um, you know the passion for for carving out, you know, these extra hours for some of the, some of the things that we want to do for our soul, you know? And, exactly. Um, so that's, that's how I see it. But no, Shelly, this has been fantastic. And thank you again, taking time out on, on a late Thursday evening that, you know, personally meant a lot to me and for everyone who's listening, uh, please drop us a feedback on, you know, Twitter or Apple podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify. I, I try to get to all of them. I try to respond to all of them. And, you know, we're very grateful that, uh, you know, Parallax is in your list of things to listen because, you know, like we were discussing, um, you know, it's a competitive content market out there. And, um, you know, we're, we're glad that we are, you know, parts of, of your lives in, in some way, shape or form. But Shelly, thanks again. This has been fantastic. Oh, I am super honored to have been invited. So thank you so much, Ankur. It's been a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. We aim to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology every second week. Review us on your favourite podcast app or send your comments or questions to podcast at radcliffe-group.com. To view the series, head to radcliffecardiology.com forward slash podcasts forward slash parallax. Thanks for listening.